And as Mark mentioned, um, he and I have been working together for about 17 years. Um, and we've worked together at the state legislature, working on litigation, working the state budget process. Um, oh, yeah. um, and we got pretty good at what we did. Uh, you know, we were able to go to Sacramento and pass laws. Um, we we're working at getting things into the budget process. Uh, we worked the administrative process at the State Water Board, and we had some pretty good victories along the way. But ultimately, um, we started to realize that this system just isn't going to work. Um, and that's 17 years of getting it pretty much the top of your game. And so when we're saying the Clean Water Act isn't going to save us, we really mean the Clean Water Act isn't going to save us. So what will save us? Um, I don't want to end this on a depressing note. That's, that's just the beginning. There's lots more hopeful things other than the BP oil spill picture in front of you. Um, we see, as Mark was saying, a lot of problems. Um, we're still, despite all of the laws that have done a significant amount of good, and I remember some serious pollution problems when I was a kid, um, we are still seeing species extinctions accelerating, climate change causing significant problems. Um, we're looking at most of the Sierra snowpack. It's going to be gone. We're seeing saltwater intrusion coming into groundwater um, from uh, over extraction of the groundwater, but also from sea level rise. And also from sea level rise, we're going to see the delta, which is the source of much of Southern California's groundwater, um, starting to be threatened. Uh, so it's not just us, as Mark was talking about, it's not just our rights that are being threatened. Because we're intimately connected with the environment, the environment's rights are important as well as our rights. We need to think about it together. So the intent was good when we set up our modern environmental laws. I mean, you, you have heard about, I'm sure, rivers catching on fire. They still sometimes do. But this was a pretty common occurrence. This was not a one-time thing back in the mid-20th um, century. So we actually did a fair amount of good. Um, but we didn't actually say that pollution was wrong. We just sort of legalized it and slowed it down. And the flaw, the flaw that we came to realize in doing this work, and doing this advocacy work year after year after year, um, is that the foundation is wrong. We're, we were assuming when we created these environmental laws that humans can still manipulate the environment. We're still separate from the environment. We can control it. You know, we, do, we talk about environmental management as if the environment needs to be managed. It's our own behavior. We need to manage ourselves. The environment's going to take care of itself. It's going to react to whatever we do. Um, and we saw in the beginning of the 20th century in U.S. conservation policy, we really saw this come to a head, um, where the U.S., the, the first director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was talking about uh, conservation in terms of managing forests, in terms of maximizing their use. So we were going to manage the environment in a way that got the most utility for people. Whereas John Muir, uh, who was a, a contemporary at the time, took the position that we're all interconnected. There's the web of life, and we, everything that we do to the environment impacts us. Um, and that, that particular fight actually came to a personal head over the Hetch Hetchy Dam um, and uh, the Hetch Hetchy Valley. And that was dammed um, as a result of that in this beautiful valley that was supposed to be similar to Yosemite and, and beauty, if not more beautiful, um, was dammed forever, at least as long as uh, we're probably around, um, which is forever for us. So what the real problem here is because we're assuming that we're separate from the environment and we can manage it um, as if we're in charge of these things, um, it, we don't assess and moderate our own behavior. We don't take a really hard look at what we're doing. And so our laws are flawed for that reason. And so we get flawed solutions. So we say, oh, we're running out of water. We just throw a bunch of desal plants up and down the coast, not realizing that it's just going to exacerbate the energy problems, cause more greenhouse gas emissions. And boy, what's going to happen with these plants along the ocean when sea level rise and floods them? So all of these things we're not really thinking about because we're just looking for the short-term solution. And because we have short-term minds based on short-term management philosophy. So we don't need to do this. Um, we made choices to get here. Um, and we have, a, we have a history in California that's not that old of doing things differently. So before everybody came in to the gold rush and said, you know, first in time, first in right, you know, the gold is ours, the water that we use to get the gold is ours, as soon as we're there first, we're just going to tack a notice up on a tree, there was a different way of doing things. So right before uh, the gold rush, when the Spanish came in, um, and they, uh, they considered water as part of the community. So people worked together, um, and water was shared. It was, not, it was not thought that people owned water to the exclusion of anybody else. And before them, which was not that long ago even, the native Californians, indigenous Californians, 
didn't even consider water as something that you could own or manage for yourself. Water had its own uh, rights and it was its own entity and it needed to be treated with respect and respected as something that was integrated with ourselves. And these are the, that's the kind of philosophy that Christopher Stone started to think about when he was challenged by his own law school class um, to uh, put, put words to the paper, in effect, when he brought up this idea, should trees have standing in their class one day? Um, and he raced to finish his seminal essay in time for it to influence the Supreme Court opinion, which it did in Sierra Club v. Morton. Um, and the dissenting opinion by Douglas, Justice Douglas, uh, talked about this idea, well, what if the environment had its own rights? And what does it mean to think about us as part of the integrated whole of the environment? And if that philosophy grounds our laws and our legal system, what kind of different actions would we as people have as opposed to this idea, this hubris that we have now that we can manage the environment? And the different elements um, that are necessary to think about this type of responsibility and standing on behalf of the environment that has to have its own rights. And if those rights are violated, that funding goes to them. The, the, what happens right now in the state, for example, you know, we have a water pollution problem, uh, that maybe there's a fine, it's not very much, it certainly doesn't consider how much it need, it, the water body needs in order to be restored, it doesn't go to the water body, it goes to Sacramento and it's doled out for whatever thing the Sacramento folks think is important. It's, it, in, and if the water body was considered as having its own rights to be clean, its own rights to be healthy, we'd be thinking very differently and we would be allocating money to make it whole. So there are examples of uh, countries and municipalities, and Kylie's going to talk about municipalities more, um, but there are certainly examples of places where we're starting to see this happen. So people are starting to have a different viewpoint. Ecuador is a place where some of you may have heard that there uh, was a new constitutional provision adopted in 2007 that said that nature has its own rights to exist and to thrive and to evolve. And that any person, and this is important, any person can step in and represent the, the environment. So the environment needs a good lawyer, um, and that lawyer needs to be a full advocate. It cannot be a government agency that's balancing industry versus environmental interests as if they're different, because it's all the same interests. You need to have your own advocate. And so just as you would have an attorney for, say, an infant um, in a custody dispute, you have an attorney that represented the environment. And again, has a right to be completely restored if we mess it up. Um, and so the, the fines, the fees, the money goes to fixing it. It doesn't go to some other government body and get distributed for some other reason. And so there has actually been a case already um, that has gone to completion earlier this year uh, in Ecuador that implemented this particular constitutional provision where a river was being destroyed by a road that was uh, being built next door. They just sort of pushed everything in the river. Um, and made the river very small and the river, uh, the channel of the river, the flow of the river was disrupted significantly. People downstream that were flooded sued on behalf of the river, not on behalf of themselves and said you need to fix this because the river has been hurt. And the court specifically said because the constitution said the river has a right to flow, you need to fix this. And so the, they did. They, the money has been allocated and they're starting to fix this problem. And this is how we start to think. This is how we start to think how we change our behaviors. Um, and I mentioned local communities around the country are starting to pass these types of ordinances as well. And this is the kind of discussion that we're having here in Santa Monica as part of the Sustainability Bill of Rights is that ecosystems have a right to exist, to thrive, to evolve. And communities are starting to do that. And they're starting to recognize that our rights to clean air and clean water are the same as the environment's rights to clean air and clean water. Um, and we've heard a lot about Citizens United. And there are some serious impediments to our progress right now. So we're having laws that are passed um, and court cases that are being interpreted to give corporations rights that are interfering with the basic rights of humans, the basic rights of the environment to exist and thrive and evolve. And those rights, those human rights, those environmental rights came out of our existence. They, the basic right to exist came out of our being on this earth. And it is incorrect for a government to come in and trump those rights and create laws that hurt the rights of individual people or groups of people or ecosystems um, on behalf of a fictional entity uh, that is somehow benefiting from hurting other people. So we need to start to think, well, how do we start to recapture our rights with laws that protect us? And it's not just about the laws, it's about the economic system as well. The balance sheets that we set up only recognize um, environmental restoration as a cost. And if you're doing business and you can do it faster and cheaper in a legal way, 
uh, by cutting corners on the environment, that's a benefit. That's good. You save money. Uh, but again, we made up these accounting sheets. We can make up something different. So we need to evaluate these new corporate and economic models. And you can see a couple of photos of what you do on the bottom, where you're actually thinking about the benefits of the river, where you've got people enjoying it, the river's healthy, and on the top, where that's the actual color of the river, which is um, poisoned with toxic algae. They came from farming that was cutting corners um, and not worrying so much about how much water they took out so the temperature would go up, or how much fertilizer and pesticide waste they were putting back in. So we need to develop accounting standards that reflect the rights of the river to be clean, the rights of the river to flow. Otherwise, we just won't change our behavior and we'll end up with green rivers. So what's possible in Santa Monica? And Mark talked quite a bit about your um, excellent sustainable city plan. It's a real model for the rest of the country. Um, but certainly, so much more can be done. Um, and that's where Santa Monica has always been good, I think, in terms of pushing themselves and thinking, well, what more can we do? Um, we can start to think, and the Sustainability Bill of Rights is starting to think about this, is how do we take these uh, metrics that we have started to put in there, um, you know, being self-sufficient in water, local water supply by 2020, for example. Um, how do we make those um, real? How do we make those something that we're going to stick to, that we've got deadlines and that there's some responsibility to make sure that those really happen, all of those deadlines? And how do we encourage solar systems? How do we make sure those are happening? And how do we prevent corporations, for example, um, for energy utilities, for example, from saying you can't do this because we're going to make you use hydrofract sources of energy? Or tar sands, which now we're seeing the tar sands are starting to look at now that it's not going through the center of the country. Maybe California is a market for that. We're starting to see a lot of that. So how can we make sure that we protect our rights in a community to healthy water, healthy air, healthy systems? Um, local energy, local water, local food, trying to remember where all of these come from and feel the impacts of how we use water, energy, food is really an important step. A lot of kids nowadays, unfortunately, and we've seen in some of these, uh, like Jamie Oliver and some of these TV shows, don't know where their food is coming from. And so we need to start to be able to show them, you know, local markets, local food, um, locally sustainable water sources, locally sustainable energy. If you're putting a solar system on your roof, you know where that energy is coming from. And we saw on the ballot last year where PG&E put a, a deceptive ballot measure on to try to prevent marine clean energy from put, having a locally sustainable utility that pushed for sustainable energy sources, tried to prevent that under the guise of consumer choice. And we need to push back on that and exercise our rights to clean energy um, with the goal of building energy independence that makes us better earth stewards, not just local stewards, but earth stewards. So we realize that what we do here in Santa Monica, here wherever you're from, um, has an impact on the rest of the world. And finally, one of the other things that we talk about, um, that, that the, uh, the ordinance talks about and that we've talked about, is we need to start to restore and think about our historic ecosystems, the place where we live. What did it look like? Um, a lot of places in California, a lot of roads were built over underground and streams, for example. We could start, maybe we can tear up the road, but we can paint where the stream is. Um, we can start to use signage, and we can start to restore native ecosystems. Um, we could start to use native grasses, native landscaping, to bring us back to the ecosystem so we know how it looked and we know how to live within it, which is most important to be able to be responsible management of ourselves. Um, and this is my daughter, um, just to remind us all of what we're all thinking about is our, our family, our friends, our world around us. <coughs> Um, and we need, we need to remember, we get, a lot, we get caught up a lot in this idea of this is the way things are, it's, it's very hard to change things, or of course corporations have rights. No, we made choices along the way, and the question was raised earlier, you know, is it right that corporations have rights? Well, yes, yeah, right as long as we say it's right. As long as we are complicit in saying that, well, gosh, you know, corporations have rights and that's what the law is, and we don't try to change that, then we're saying it's okay. And so we can say something different. We have that power. We can change the law. We can change the economic system. We can change the balance sheets. We can change how we implement it, how we live our lives to recognize that what we do has an impact. And we can make it so that we are pushing for a better earth for our kids, for our families, for our future. Thank you.